Hello and welcome back to AP Psychology. I'm Miss Lee. We are starting our final unit, Social Psychology. By the end of this video, you should be able to apply the attribution theory to explain motives using several different terms. The fundamental attribution error, the self-serving bias, false consensus effect, confirmation bias, just world hypothesis, and the halo effect, also sometimes known as the halo error. You should also be able to identify important figures and research in the areas of attitude formation and change, and there is a bunch, including Leon Festinger, Philip Zimbardo, Stanley Milgram, to name just a few. You should also be able to discuss attitude formation and change, including persuasion strategies and cognitive dissonance, including the central route of persuasion and the peripheral route of persuasion, as well as cognitive dissonance and the elaboration likelihood model. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and grab your notes and let's get started. Okay, so we're talking about social psychology. What is that? It is the scientific study of how we think about influence and relate to one another. So there is a give and take here. There is a relationship. There's a big emphasis on social cognition, or in other words, the mental processes associated with the ways in which people perceive and react to others. Through social cognition, each person creates a unique perception of reality. So basically, everyone has their own perception of what's really happening. So in that sense, doesn't it make sense that everyone's reality is somewhat different and still true? In your notes, do your best to write down a definition in your own words. Don't look this up. No cheatsies of what it means to attribute something, whether it's an action, a behavior, an event, whatever that means to you, write down what that means. The attribution theory tries its best to explain the causes of people's behavior, including our own behavior, either by crediting external or situational factors or the person's internal disposition, so their personality, stuff that's going on inside and it's one or the other. So let's say you just got an A on your test. Yay, go you. Under your definition of attribution, make a situational attribution for this good grade. So do your best to explain it from a situational standpoint and make a dispositional attribution for this good grade. So something from within you. So examples of that could be a situational attribution. Oh, the test was super easy. Oh, that teacher really likes me, so she probably gave me extra credit. The dispositional attribution could be something like, well, I'm just super good at psychology. You know, I just, it really just comes naturally to me. So you see there, there are some things that are explaining this same scenario, the A, but in different ways. The fundamental attribution error is the tendency to over-attribute or over explain the behavior of others to internal dispositional factors such as a personal disposition like your personality trait. When it comes to our own behavior, we are much more aware and sensitive to how our behavior changes with the different situations we encounter rather than our personality traits alone. So what that means is usually we attribute what happens to other people as happening because of their internal stuff. So we tend to overemphasize behavior based on someone's internal factors or their personal disposition, their personality traits. When it comes to our own behavior, we tend to do the opposite. And we're, I'm talking about primarily negative stuff. So if something bad happens, it's because of who they are. If something bad happens to us, we usually attribute it to something else in the environment. I was having a really bad day. I was distracted. There was sun in my eyes. In relation to the attribution theory, there is this phenomenon known as the self-serving bias. This is the tendency to attribute one's successes to internal factors, disposition, and one's failures, so this is both, to external factors, the situation. So often this comes into play when one commits the fundamental attribution error. Using this self-serving bias as an explanation, if you get an A on the test, it's due to what? something internal. I'm just super smart. I'm really good at this. If you get an F on the test, it's due to what? Some type of situational or external factors. There, I was really distracted. I didn't get good sleep the night before. She skipped that in the videos. I never saw that. 
something external. The false consensus effect is a cognitive bias where people tend to overestimate the extent to which their own opinions, beliefs, preferences, values, etc., are normal and typical. So you believe that you are kind of run of the mill, nothing, nothing to see here, folks, and everyone else's opinions, beliefs, and habits are the same. For example, you just can't bring yourself to understand why someone wouldn't just love mashed potatoes or coffee, your very favorite food in the whole world. This can be a big one. If you're voting the Democrat or Republican ticket this year or whatever it is that you're voting, you believe that most people will. Like, why wouldn't they? Like, how could it not be that way? That's the false consensus effect. It, you believe that you are part of a majority consensus. Confirmation bias is also related to the attribution theory. This is also a type of cognitive bias where one tends to search for, interpret in certain ways, favor, and recall information in a way that confirms or strengthens one's prior personal beliefs or hypothesis. So you already believe something, so the way that you are interpreting data related to it, I really believe that coffee is really good for you. So what I'm going to look for is research that supports that, and I'm going to just kind of pushed by the research that states that it's not. We've seen this term multiple times before, so think of an example from your own life and jot it down in your notes. When do you have confirmation bias? The just world hypothesis is also related to attribution theory. This is another cognitive bias, Ooh, we've got a lot, or an assumption that our actions will inherently bring due consequences. So good things are coming to us if we act right and bad things will happen if we don't, or bad things will happen to that person, they'll eventually get theirs. So we're, we'll be rewarded for good behavior and punished for bad. Hang on to this term as we're going to discuss it more in a future set of notes, so just put a pin in that one. The halo effect, this is also sometimes called the halo error. This is the tendency for positive impressions of a person or a company or a brand or a product in one area to positively influence one's opinion in other areas about that same person or company or brand or product. The opposite is called the horn effect, by the way, not really as common. The halo effect is commonly used in marketing. So for example, you really feel good about and just know that you're gonna love the new McDonald's breakfast sandwich because you already love their Egg McMuffin or you're for sure going to love the hazelnut macchiato because you already super love the caramel macchiato. So how could companies take advantage of this in marketing, like when a company is trying to sell you its products? Another concept that you need to be familiar with is attitudes. Simply put, this is how we feel about something. These are beliefs and feelings that predispose our reactions to objects, people, and events. Social psychologists believe that attitudes are made up of three components, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a mnemonic. It's not in the direction that would be most helpful, but I think it'll still work. It's the ABCs of attitudes. So you've got cognitive, which is a set of beliefs about the attributes of an object, affective, or feelings about the object, and behavioral, way people act towards the object. If someone is nice, we may feel kindness towards them and act in a friendly way. So you've got this belief system about someone being nice or how you are interpreting their behavior and you have a feeling about them, you feel kindness towards them, and then you act kind in return. So it's the ABCs of attitudes. So let me ask you this. Do you think that your attitudes determine your decisions and your actions? What about with regard to food you don't like? Do you tend to choose it? Even if it's like the super most healthful like ridiculously good for you food on the planet, if you don't like it, do you tend to eat it? Probably not. And if you do, it's probably not in the amount that would be most beneficial. Our attitudes do influence our actions. According to the Elaboration Likelihood Model, or ELM, of persuasion, attitudes can change our behavior. Developed by Richard Petty and John Cacioppo, this model aims to explain different ways of processing stimuli, why they're used, and how they change attitudes. Basically, there are two major routes of persuasion. So as we're going over these routes of persuasion, think about how advertising might use these different routes. The central route of persuasion is a direct way of giving you information, trying to sell you an item, trying to persuade you. Attitudes change when interested people already interested people focus on the scientific evidence or arguments and respond with favorable thoughts. So they use the data, 
they use the information that they're given to make an educated decision. The peripheral route of persuasion is an indirect way of persuading. It's an indirect way of changing attitudes, and this is when people make snap judgments on incidental cues, like the attractiveness of a speaker or the fact that that speaker is well-known or memories that are brought up because of that classic jingle that you hear and you're like, oh my gosh, that reminds me of that holiday that I spent with my family that time. Those are both techniques using the peripheral route of persuasion. Attitudes also influence our actions if outside influences on what we say and do are minimal. So if there's not a lot of controversy or not a lot of debate, then we generally follow our attitudes. If the attitude is specifically relevant to the behavior, so the more specific the attitude is to the action, the more likely the two are to match. Your attitudes about running a mile a day will help predict whether you run when you're exercising. We're keenly aware of our attitudes. So our attitudes influence action if we're keenly aware of our attitudes. When we know and are conscious of what we believe, we are truer to ourselves. So let me ask you this. Do you believe it can be the opposite? Can our actions influence what we think or our attitudes about something? Well, yes, we have discovered that attitudes can follow behaviors. A couple of phenomenons you need to know here, the foot in the door phenomenon. This is the tendency for people who agree to a small request to comply to a bigger one. To get people to agree to something, you start small and you build. We'll be talking about Milgram's shock experiment, but keep in mind, there was a reason why he wanted to discover why people would be willing to shock each other at lethal doses just because they were asked to. So this is related to the foot in the door phenomenon. People find it hard to say no when they've already agreed to something similar, but in smaller steps. The door in the face phenomenon is asking first for a big favor or one that is likely to be denied. You already know that. Then after being turned down, the asker agrees that the request was excessive and asks for something else, something that the person actually wanted in the first place. Because the person appears to be willing to compromise and because the request seems modest in comparison to the first, it's more likely to be granted than if it had been asked at the outset. So you look like you're compromising and meeting halfway, even though you really never wanted the Lamborghini, you, you were perfectly fine with, you know, the new Ford, whatever. So asking for a big thing in comparison to asking for the thing that you, is right in front of you and you really want in the first place is the door in the face phenomenon. The social comparison theory centers on the belief that we're driven to gain accurate self-evaluations, like we want to know about ourselves, and that we gain accurate self-evaluations by comparing ourselves to others in order to reduce uncertainty in these unknown areas in which we're self-evaluating. And this is based on Leon Fessinger's work, and this serves as a basis for downward comparison, so comparing ourselves to people who are worse or lower than us, and upward comparison, people who are better or higher than us. So in other words, when you're deciding where to find a job or where you'll go to college, do you just figure it out completely on your own? Who do you seek advice or insight from? You're probably going to ask a variety of people, not just your peers, like your on-level peers, you're probably gonna ask a lot of different types of people. And this is the social comparison theory. Going back to Leon Fessinger, the cognitive dissonance theory is when people become aware of the inconsistencies or the dissonance between their attitudes and behavior. We talked about this back in the cognition unit. They become anxious and they're motivated to make these two line up. So when there is an, a misalignment between attitudes and behavior, this is what can happen. Again, this is Leon Fessinger's work. An example of that would be the story about the fox and the grapes. Rather than admit to his failure to reach the grapes, the fox rationalizes that they're not actually desirable. So he reaches for them, he fails, and he at the end decides they're not even worth it anyway when in fact they were delicious. The fox is basically seen as trying to overcome its cognitive dissonance. It's basically attempting to hold incompatible ideas at the same time. So both desire and frustration, desire for the grapes that are delicious and the frustration of not being able to reach them no matter how hard it tried. So it had to realign one or the other. Since the behavior wasn't working, it realigned its attitude. And this works in humans as well, because behavior is difficult to change. People usually reduce the dissonance by changing the inconsistent attitude, because what's easier to change, how you think or how you act? You may think it's how you act 
until you have to go on a diet or you have to give up a substance or you have to do something that you really don't want to do. You can usually rationalize your behavior and continue on with the behavior. That's cognitive dissonance. Okay, so let's talk about one other example of how attitudes follow behaviors. In Philip Zimbardo's very famous Stanford prison study, wasn't really an experiment because there wasn't a control group, but we know of it as the experiment. The role playing that the guards and the prisoners affected their attitudes towards one another. And the experiment, if you're not familiar with it, the study was to see how people would act in this simulation. Philip Zimbardo was a professor at Stanford University, and he basically took a summer and recreated a prison scenario in the basement of the psychology building at Stanford University. He randomly selected half of his participants to be prisoners and half to be guards and kind of let them loose. Um, there's some debate about really what went on um, and the, the methodology involved. But basically, the guards acted in very cruel manners to the prisoners, and the prisoners allowed it to happen for the most part. Um, they became obedient. They complied, um, even with very humiliating and degrading directives given by the prison guards. And you may think how this could possibly apply to our lives because we're not being kidnapped and forced to play prisoner or prison guard every day. However, we are in situations where there are some guidelines to behavior, even if it's unwritten. The results of this study, the prison guards and even Zimbardo himself admitted that they were so consumed with their role that they acted in ways that they never would have outside that role. And this is basically showing the impact of how a specific situation can affect our behavior. And that is it for social thinking. In our next video, we'll be talking about social influence. I can't wait to see you then. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.